and that and all the other jerks <laughs> as well, Bernie, Steve, you know, we're all jerks. Um, so Anton did a great job and I'd, I'd been through it once with 24 hour party people. I mean, the thing you have to remember is, is that when Ian died, both, we, we, we were 23. So we didn't know what the hell to do. We were a lot, a lot less educated than most young people are now at 23. So I just went and locked myself in the pub, you know, and said, when it's all over, just tell me and I'll come out, you know. And Bernard did the same thing. And so you didn't witness, we went to the funeral, but we didn't witness a lot of it. And then we threw ourselves into new order. So you sort of hid the grief or misplaced it, you know, you managed to put it to one side. I mean, that's been one of the wonderful things about getting the music back after 34 years. It's been fantastic because I put it away at 30. I never did anything with it, you know, to actually get it back. And to get, close, bless you, and get closer <laughs> played up, because we never played closer, has been wonderfully enjoyable. And the thing was is that I've never really faced the sad facts of Ian's life, because uh, Rob Gretton went to see him when he was dead. And I think Steve went, but I didn't go. You know, they asked me if I wanted to go, and I went, go and see a corpse. Oh, no, I'll go to the pub. I mean, I really regret that, because I really do, now that I'm older, and I realise that things like that in life are very important to say goodbye and to, so you can move on, you know. So what we did was, Bernard and I in particular, was that we managed to put our grief away in a little box and ignore it. You know, just get on with New Order, which I think why one of the reasons why New Order was so successful was that we threw ourselves into it with no backward look. We just left Joy Division completely alone and just went straight, you know, we ignored it completely to everybody's shock. Everybody was shocked about how much we ignored it. And the only time I got to see it was on 24 hour party people. I was like, oh my God, you know, it was a horrible thing to witness, all four of us. Steve, Rob, Gillian, Bernard and I were really shocked when we saw 24 hour bike people because it dwelt on the, you know, death a lot. So by the time you got to control, um, you were almost ready for it. I mean, the worst thing was when, when we were in Cannes watching the finished film. So I'd seen the, a rough edit, but I'd not seen the finished film. And, you know, it got to the bit right at the end. And it's always that weird thing about atmosphere, right? You know, it's like Robbie Williams always says that he wrote angels and it's always at uh, weddings and we wrote atmosphere and it's always at funerals. And it's times like control when you see atmosphere used when you wish you'd written angels. <laughs> Instead, ah, oh, God, you know, it's like a, it breaks your heart at that particular point when that happens. And in Cannes, it was sold out, 2,000 people in the cinema watching it. And that bit cut through you like, oh God, you know, it broke your heart. It was the bit where he died on the screen. And then everyone started clapping. And I was like, fucking clapping at me, bastard. It was really odd, you know what I mean? It was like, it wasn't a film, it was your life. So it was an odd situation to be in, but you know, I suppose I'm quite lucky in that I've had two films made about me and I'm still alive. <laughs> Such work. Yeah. In, in the aspects of Ian Curtis, I mean, there is a... Okay, we've got two minutes only, so it's going to be very short now, so... Um, one of the things you, you do get a sense of from, you know, watching the films or whatever, is that as Joy Division happened, it, did you feel like distance from Ian Curtis? Because it almost seemed like, you know, you did your bit and Ian no, went around no, doing no, his own Ian, we, we were all very, very close okay. and very, very together and it's, it's actually... Um, the, the pain he was going through while you made Closer was the worst because he was so frustrated by his illness. And you know, the, the weird thing is, is that when, when they were doing Control, they took Ian's prescriptions for his epilepsy um, to a, a epilepsy expert now. And the epilepsy expert looked at Ian's prescriptions, his tablets, and said, this was guaranteed to kill him. You know, that's how much the, the treatment and how much expertise they have now compared to how much they had then. And the thing is, is that, you know, we were just two tossers from Salford. You know, we, what, what chance did we have when all the experts didn't know what they were bloody doing either? But to watch Ian go through it, because he was so frustrated, and he was his own worst enemy, in that if you'd say to him, are you all right, Ian? He'd go, I'm on top of the world. I'm great, come on, let's get on with it. And you'd be like, that was the thing you most wanted to hear. So you always went with it, 
you know, and I think in a, in a way, you, you feel the guilt about that. But he always told you exactly what you wanted to hear, because he didn't want to let you down, because he was the one, as I've said before, that always used to pick you up by the scruff of the neck. Whenever you started to go down, whenever you weren't getting any gigs, whenever the press were against you, whenever, you know, things weren't going right, it was always him that used to pick you up and go, come on, we can do it, you know. And so I think he kept that up for, for us. And you know, unfortunately, you know, he, he paid the price of it. And that's why the, the, the turnaround at the end in his illness was, was so shocking, you know. So it was awful. I mean, I was, I was with him on the Friday night before he killed himself on the Saturday night and we were cock a hoop, you know, screaming in, in the car, jumping up and down on the seats because we were going to America. Because it was like a dream come true, you know, to take your shit hot band to America. It was like, it was, it was the zenith, the peak of our career, you know. And, and, and now I just say, oh God, this guy was bipolar. You know, one minute he was really up, the next minute he was really down. Unfortunately, when he was really down, there was nobody with him. On Closer, when we all lived together while we were recording, you, could, you were there for the highs and you were there for the lows, so you could get him through it. But it just happened that on that particular low, there was nobody with him, you know. It was a very, very tragic end. Well, we do have the news again, obviously, a lot of us is very pleased about that. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I mean, no more than me. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is an odd thing because, you know, to play it now and uh, to be appreciated, because when I did, the very idea of me playing it in England unleashed a, a tidal wave of criticism. The fact that you would actually dare to play it and uh, the fact that Stephen and Bernard fell into that as well. It's actually quite odd because I mean, all you're doing is playing the music. You know, it's like you're not emulating the band; you're just playing your interpretation as a as a way to say, "Fuck me, these are great songs." You know, and it's it's actually been very nice to play them and for people to appreciate what what you do and the way the the respect that you um, that you show it. You know, so it's been nice. I must admit. And people can hear it in what is it? Forty minutes. Well, yeah, the way you're, you're, right, you're going, yeah. <laughs> I, I was, was hoping to get a lie down. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got the evil, evil look now. So, Peter, thank you very much you're for welcome. coming. It's been a Der er en mailinglist, man kan skrive sig på herovre, for der kommer meget mere af den her slags her på Københavns Hovedbibliotek. Ha' en god aften!